Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a research partner at Paradigm, a crypto asset investment firm, but I'm here representing my own views um, and not those of the fund. So I'm going to be talking about um, two concepts, um, one from cryptocurrency and one from um, finance and decentralized finance, um, and talking about how they share this common uh, uh, element that lets us combine them in this, in this sort of fun and interesting way. Um, and so those two elements are payment channels, on the one hand, and synthetic assets and swaps um, on the other. So first, I'll talk a little about channels. Now, this is like a really smart conference generally. And so like, I'm just going to assume all of you actually know how channels work or have a basic idea of uh, enough of an idea that you know, I'm not actually going to insult your intelligence by trying to explain channels to you. But uh, the part that I want to underline here is just, is just kind of like uh, the structure of it. So you've got this 10 ETH um, uh, collateral, right? And this is, this is sort of what's, what's backing the payment channel. Where is it? It's, it's on chain. What kind of chain? It's on a blockchain. Um, this, you know, this is like, uh, uh, obviously, a very secure way to store 10 ETH. I mean, like, look at the word, right? It's got block and chain. These are two very strong words. But it's very inefficient to try to actually move this around. You've got low latency. Um, uh, you know, there's relatively low throughput on the whole system. So in order to make it more efficient, um, we go up to this rain cloud where we have a payment channel uh, between these two parties. So this is a um, channel that's backed by, these, uh, by this uh, real asset on chain um, in ETH, but in channel land, where people can update it just by signing messages back and forth, um, you can make payments uh, instantly or, or, or very close to instantly um, and without paying any fees uh, on the main chain. So that's how, that's, uh, you know, basic concept of payment channel, you know how that works. Uh, here's sort of another, another concept, um, and this is one that was really sort of pioneered by Maker um, on-chain, and, and there are some other on-chain synthetic assets, uh, uh, systems like, like UMA. Um, but there's also, um, this, is like a, this is an idea that just has a very long history in finance generally, um, and we're just sort of like rediscovering it here. Uh, so how does this work? You've still got 10 ETH collateral. Now notice this, there's some collateral here, but instead of you know, uh, us keeping these balances sort of off-chain. Let's imagine we're doing it all on-chain. Um, so here, Alice and Bob start out with a 5 ETH, um, uh, five ETH balance uh, in ETH. Suppose they want to uh, trade ETH for dollars. Now, there's no dollars on the main chain yet, right? Um, nobody's issued any kind of dollars on it. There's only ETH here. But you can actually get exposure to dollars um, by having these people enter into this, uh, this particular kind of swap. So the way this works is, Alice's balance, um, her share of this collateral is now, she has 10 ETH minus $500. Right now, that's worth $500 or 5 ETH. Um, but if the price of ETH changes, that could, she could uh, sort of change the, uh, uh, her value. So uh, and similarly, Bob has just $500 no matter what happens to the price of ETH. So Alice has gone leveraged long ETH. Bob has gone, uh, is just sort of like holding stable. Um, and... You know, right now, ETH is at, is at uh, 100, but let's see. Yes, yes. All right, I knew it was a good idea to join a cryptocurrency hedge fund. Take that, mom. Yeah, so, you know, ETH, ETH skyrockets here. Alice has, has had um, a great day. She's at, um, she now has $2,000. Bob still has $500. Uh, Bob hasn't lost money. He's not short ETH exactly, but he has less ETH than he would have had if he just held on to his five ETH. Now he only has two ETH because that's what $500 is worth in ETH. Oh no, oh no. Um, so uh, this is crashed back down to earth. What's happened now, Bob owns all of the collateral in the channel because the price is, has crashed so far. Um, notice if the price goes any lower, um, Alice just like, you know, there's, there's, there's no more money you can get from Alice. So Bob actually now has ETH exposure. So if the price of ETH goes down, Bob's, the value of Bob's portfolio will go a little down. So technically, you'd, you'd definitely want to have some kind of liquidation mechanism here where if Bob gets too close to this, Alice can liquidate him um, and maybe she can enter the position somewhere else. Because here, or sorry, I'm sorry, Bob can liquidate Alice. Um, because here, you know, Bob will now end up with ETH exposure that he maybe doesn't want. Um, okay, so that's how, that's rough, this is roughly how Maker, uh, MakerDAO works. It's, it's roughly how a lot of sort of synthetic on-chain things work. Um, what are rainbow channels? So rainbow channels are just taking advantage of the fact that in both of these constructs, we had this like 10 ETH collateral pot of gold. Um, so just do the synthetic thing, but we're gonna do it off-chain in a channel. So here, um, you know, you can just imagine 
uh, Alice and Bob have this position, and it's in a channel so they can trade these assets back and forth with each other. It's all backed by ETH on chain, but in, these, uh, in this uh, sort of uh, swap in this, in this channel, they can hold whatever positions they want. So, um, okay, so what, what can they do with this off chain? Well, suppose they start out um, with a, where their channel has this particular state, where each of them has five ETH. Um, they can do a trade. Now, you know, this is, this is not like a payment. This is, they, they each have this, this is still worth $500 uh, or, or five ETH for each of them. Um, but now Alice has gone, you know, uh, so first they've done a trade, this is entirely off chain. Alice um, is effectively shorting uh, USD, short fiat, short the bankers, um, and going leveraged long ETH. Whereas um, Bob is holding a stable asset, so he got a stable coin, and is earning a yield on that. So um, you know, this is like the entire DeFi stack all in you know one sort of like pretty off-chain package. Okay, so how does this work? Um, like, how do we actually make it so that these your exposure is to these assets when all the collateral on chain is in ETH? So there's three ways to construct them, and I'm just going to go over them uh, fairly quickly. The first one is maybe sort of like the uh, most obvious one and barely worth explaining, but I wanted to use this prism uh, 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 clip art. So if you have, um, uh, Alice has, you know, has, has uh, Bitcoin in this channel, Bob is USD, but it's all uh, ultimately backed by, um, by ETH or by, or by Bitcoin. You can just say, here's exactly what this is worth at this particular time. Um, you know, so, uh, so when you actually close the channel, the, con the contract, the escrow contract will just say, will just look it up on a price oracle and say, we're going to give eight ETH to Alice, and we're going to give two ETH to Bob, because that's what these positions are worth. Um, so that's, that's, that's nice and all, but this depends on having a, an on-chain price oracle, which is um, you know, something, something of a hard problem and re sometimes requires trust. Um, so there's other ways to do it that don't require a price oracle. So one of these is physical settlement. So this works when you have um, uh, something, an asset that's already on the Ethereum chain. So it won't work for dollars, um, but it does work for something like DAI. Uh, so, um, here, you know, like Alice has this, has this position um, with 10 ETH, but she's short $1,000 uh, because Bob has that, has that uh, much. So when they close the channel, Alice has to deliver 1,000 die, like actual die, to the contract, say, within 24 hours. And then the contract will give them, uh, uh, you know, will give, will give Alice her 10 ETH and will give Bob uh, the 1,000 die that Alice just provided. So that's kind of nice. Um, the, uh, uh, what happens if Alice doesn't um, deliver their 1,000 die is Bob just gets all the collateral. And by supposition here, we're, we're, uh, hopefully this position is fully collateralized. Um, so which it's always gonna be in Alice's interest to deliver that die. So this works fairly nicely for, but only, it only works for assets that are on, already on chain and only works on some um, you know, fairly like, uh, sophisticated smart contract platforms that can, that can sort of do this kind of thing with, uh, with tokens. So, um, there's one more way to, way, way to construct it, and this one, not only does it not require a price oracle, but it can be done um, on any payment channel network, on any payment channel implementation, um, including even Bitcoin, including on top of the Lightning Network. So how does this work? Alice and Bob start out, say, with a five um, uh, Bitcoin position, um, but they enter into this trade, the same trade where Alice now goes leveraged long Bitcoin, and let's suppose the price of Bitcoin is $10,000, Alice goes leverage long Bitcoin, um, and Bob, you know, just holds, holds sort of uh, a stable position of fifty thousand um, dollars. Now, so what what happens when um, the price changes? So, when if the price of Bitcoin is just ticked up by one dollar, um, Alice's position, as computed according to what her actual position is, not just what her balance is on the on that Lightning channel, um, is now worth ten dollars more. Uh, so you know, it's worth 0. 0.0005 Bitcoin more, and, Alice, and Bob's is worth 0. 0.0005 Bitcoin less. So what happens is Bob just makes a 0. 0. 0.005 0. 0.0005 payment to Alice. Um, and why, why does Bob do that? To keep the channel open, because they've just agreed this is what we're gonna be doing. Um, and so they're basically going back and forth. What happens when the price goes back? Alice makes the same payment back. So at any one point, yes, you can defect, but you know the, the the strategy. Presumably, both these parties entered into this channel for a reason. Maybe it's to um, maybe when someone's earning interest. Maybe you just sort of want that stable. Bob just wants the stable position. And in order to keep that uh, position open, you kind of just go back and forth tit for tat every time the price 
um, ticks down. So here, oh man, the, the Bitcoin price has gone below $10,000, right here is a key support level. Um, but uh, here, you know, like what happens, Alice ke keeps giving money to Bob and this could happen all the way down, right? Like at any one point, Alice could only scam Bob for like a few dollars. Um, but, you know, over time, Alice ends up making a bunch of payments to Bob. Um, so ultimately, like, you know, this, this ends up replicating this, this position um, with only sort of a minimal amount of short-term trust. What is the rainbow network? So here we have um, one rainbow channel between Alice and Bob. A problem with this is suppose like Alice is just a user. She wants to use this network. Um, she has to find somebody who wants to take the opposite of every trade um, that she makes, right? Because every time, um, you know, she buys ETH, the other, uh, you know, the other party has to short ETH. Every time, um, you know, like, like she, she enters in some position, um, she has to find this one counterparty who's actually taking the opposite side of that. And maybe Bob doesn't want to be on the opposite side of that trade. You know, Bob wants to have sort of like a, like a fixed portfolio. Um, what Bob can do is hedge this position by entering into another um, rainbow channel, maybe. Anyway, he can also, he could go hedge it on BitMEX. He could go hedge it just by holding physical assets. Um, but Bob just like enters into this, into this position where Bob has the opposite exposure. Um, and so as a result, Bob ends up with whatever exposure they want and they just hedge any exposure that Alice is getting from them. So Bob is like a market maker here. Um, so, you know, this, this rainbow connection between these, uh, these two channels, doesn't, these channels don't even have to know about each other. This isn't like lightning where, you know, like these multi-hop uh, payments are sort of done through this dance that, that coordinates these different channels. The only reason these two channels, uh, uh, the only person who needs to know about both these channels is Bob. And it's entirely Bob's business whether he like, goes and hedges it on this or hedges it somewhere else. All Alice cares about is what's going on in her own channel. So she doesn't care about cross-channel atomic transactions or anything like that. All right, so what's, um, uh, what is left to be done? I think uh, there is, you know, like, like I sort of just papered over all the liquidation ideas. Um, and you, you really sort of do need to have some kind of uh, liquidation mechanism. Um, there's a lot of other cool things you could probably do on top of this um, because, you know, this, is, this can rep replicate any bilateral um, contract. Any position can be done in a, uh, in a payment channel in this way. So you could, you could put in options. You could put in um, sort of flows like interest rates into there. Um, one problem with the Rainbow Network is uh, that the, this hedging mechanism is not very capital efficient. Like if you notice, Alice, uh, Bob here has a bunch of assets in both of these channels. Um, but like he's he's not doing it to get exposure. He's just doing it to basically give Alice and Charlie these opposite exposures that they sort of want. So it would be more efficient if we could somehow put Alice and Charlie together. But that requires an on-chain transaction. So figuring that out, I think, um, uh, is sort of an is sort of an open problem. And there's maybe some ways like using Plasma or something like that to to do that. We should have thought something about it. Um, oh yeah, and implementing. So I'm I'm just not going to build it. So if anybody who wants to um, uh, come talk to me, um, yeah, and you can the best way to reach me reach out on, at Dan Robinson on Twitter. Um, and I have another paper which I really want to shell called the Yield Protocol, um, which came out after the submission deadline for this conference, but uh, which is uh, about basically synthetics on chain, but it's specifically in order to get an interest rate oracle to get um, uh, uh, sort of, it's, it's zero coupon bonds on chain, so the price at which they trade tells you this particular uh, interest rate over a term um, and gives you insight into the term structure of interest rates. So if you like DeFi, I would definitely recommend checking that out as well. All right. Um, uh, that's it. Any, any questions? Can you hear me? Yep. Um, so one um, question about, so you said that Bob and Alice both have incentive to keep the channel open, right? So what happens if, like, say, you know, you're doing this Bitcoin die, and right now one Bitcoin is 10,000 dies, but the price of Bitcoin starts going down. And at one point, Alice says, actually, I'm done here, right? You close the channel if you want to, but I'm done, right? What happens in this situation? How do you prevent it from happening? So you, you can't prevent it from happening. Um, it well, depends on the construction, right? So in the one where it's like tit for tat, where we're, we're updating continuously cash settling, there's just no way to avoid that. Um, if you've got, if you're doing it on Ethereum, you can actually structure this, the cancellation right in any way you want. So you could just say you have to hold this position um, for this amount of time. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's maybe a bit of a cheat, but um, you can also, so suppose taking even the continuous cash settle and, uh, uh, mechanism, um, if Alice does leave the position, Bob doesn't, doesn't really lose value there, although maybe like they lost one tick of price. Um, they just lose the exposure that they wanted, so now they're exposed to Bitcoin, um, which they didn't want to be. 
they can go to um, somewhere else and just like hedge that position. They go on BitMEX and they just like hedge it. They go into another rainbow channel and they hedge it. Um, so you know that, that does require Bob to be online. Oh yeah, the one downside of this is you, you do need to be online to do that continuous cash settled thing, but you gotta be online to run a lightning channel anyway. Um, so yeah, so Bob has to sort of go hedge it somewhere else, but certainly it's a tough problem. Okay, so this question might be kind of orthogonal to the ethos of DeFi, but let's say I work at a centralized exchange and want to build a rainbow network um, on top of the exchange which can provide a price oracle for different asset prices and potentially also a physical settlement layer. Um, doing that might introduce KYC issues for a centralized exchange that needs to know who's trading on both sides of um, you know, the channel. Do you know if there's a way to mitigate that KYC issue or is it just, you know, native right. to the state of layer two payment channels. So the question is if, if a, um, an exchange wants to run a, wants to like have a rainbow channel open? Sure, yeah, or with, per, some, with, per, with a user? Perhaps um, provide the price oracle, you know, services or physical settlement. Oh, you know, I don't know, I'm, I'm, uh, I can't say I'm not a lawyer, but I, I'm, I, don't, I don't practice <laughs> law anymore. Um, but I, I, I would say, I, I, don't, I think there's less risk, of, you know, if you're just like running a price oracle, that's just sort of like sending information out into the ether. Um, that I don't, I'm not, I don't think that necessarily requires you to like KYC everybody who sees that data, right? So that's, that's you know, maybe it's maybe a little easier if you just want to run a price oracle. Obviously, if you want to um, open a channel with somebody, you know, like that, that's, then you're under all, probably all the same obligations you would be, I imagine, um, uh, with anyone you send Bitcoin to. Um, but like, yeah, so I think you know, that's, that's the exchange's problem. Do you work for an exchange? I do. Cool. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for your answer. Hi. So in this uh, totally decentralized system, where do, do you imagine the order book existing? Do Bob and Alice just know about each other in advance before opening a channel? Yeah, so um, I think the structure of the market would probably look somewhat more like how the OTC swap market works, um, where people, you know, you, you sort of have to like find somebody, you have one particular counterparty that's probably doing most of your mar market making with you, and then these market makers all kind of have relationships with each other. Um, or with even some like sort of centralized, uh, really big clearinghouse. Um, so yeah, I think typically it would be like you'd, you'd have some kind of like, I'm not gonna call them a broker because you know who knows what it is regulatorily. Uh, but but you know, you have this counterparty that uh, that finds that quotes prices for you. And you know if they if they sort of abuse that power, then you you go find somebody else. Um, but yeah. Anyone else? We have more time for questions. Okay. Oh. Well, I'm just curious like about, have you got specific constructions for options using the scheme? Um, I think you could probably do it the same way um, so, this, so, sorry, so on, on like the Ethereum one, you could probably do it just the same way you do an option on chain, more or less, um, which is just like this is you have a particular right, you know, maybe to exit this channel, uh, this particular, you know, and, and uh, purchase this at any particular time at the current price. Um, in the continuous cash settled model, uh, one interesting way maybe to do it is you can if you can agree on just like a model for the um, like a, like a, a pricing model for the option, then you can just like trade anything. You can trade any number that you want um, in this continuous cash settled model. So we just say like you know oh the you know volatility has gone up. I don't know the you know time uh, has decreased. We recalculate. We just plug it back into Black Scholes and then it tells us what this price should be, and we just treat that as the as the price that we're simulating. Yeah. All right, thank you. Cool.